Hi friends, welcome to Reading Through the Gospels with me, Jennifer Colburn. We are reading through the book of Luke and we are currently on chapter 14. So read with me. So we read Luke chapter 14, verse one. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of the leader of the Pharisees and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in religious law, is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. Then he turned to them and said, which of you doesn't work on Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into the pit, don't you rush to get him out? Again, they could not answer. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he turned to the, the, his host, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Hearing this, the man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with a story. A man prepared a great feast and set, sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guest, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the towns and invite the poor and the crippled and blind and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I have invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. 
Salt is good for season, seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Chapter 15. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and, and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't stayed away, strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search it carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth among his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant, distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out and a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying off hunger, of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you, both heaven and uh, both heaven and you, and I no longer am worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and the sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was, he was told, and your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you, and I've never refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all the time you gave me, in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by fat, killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, 
and everything I have is yours. He had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Chapter 16. Jesus told this, this story to this, his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that a manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be, for to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't know what the, what, I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. Ugh, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. How? It says, ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And now how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of the world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be, dis you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, you will trust who will trust you with the true riches of heaven. And if you are not faithful, with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. This, what this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Until John the Baptist, the law of Moses, and the messages of the prophets were your guides. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone is eager to get in. But that doesn't mean that the law was lost its, its force. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the smallest point of God's law to be overturned. For example, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. And anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Jesus said, there was a certain man, rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scrapes from the rich man's table, sorry, scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died 
and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. Lost my spot, sorry. <laughs> there in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Chapter 17 one day Jesus said to his disciples, There will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the temp tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. If there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry, but, mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare me, pre prepare my meal, put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samarian, Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, When will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, The kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, Here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will no longer see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you but you won't see it. 
The time has come when you will long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. People will tell you, look, there's the Son of Man, or here he is, but don't go out and follow them. For the lighting, lightning flashes and the lights and lights up the sky from one end to the other. So it will be on that day when the Son of Man comes. But first the Son of Man must suffer terribly and be rejected by this generation. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until the morning Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be a bu be busy. Sorry, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return home. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. If you cling to your life, you will lose it, and if you let your life go, you will save it. That night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women, women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Where will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked. Jesus replied, Just as the gathering of the vultures shows, there's a carcass nearby. So these signs indicate that the end is near. Blessings.